in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you as we are learning today. So many truths you are unfolding to us, Lord. The many truths that are in the Bible. Lord, we did not know you, but so nicely, but now we know everything. You know everything about us, Lord. You know when we sit and when we stand, even the very hair on our heads is numbered. But you know, even the very hair on our head is numbered. Yes, Lord. You have determined the exact time of our birth and where we would live. Lord, you are not distant and angry, but you are completely complete expression of love, Lord. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. You have been misrepresented by those who don't know you, Lord, in John 8. Lord, you are not distant and angry, but you are complete expression of love. Yeah, I'm saying it again. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are my Father, and you love us even as you love your Son, Jesus. For in Jesus, your love for us is revealed. You have always been a father and will always be a father to us, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for having given us Jesus, and our, you know, and we have received the right to become the children of God because we believe in his name. Lord, we thank you for this warrior of Brother Vincent. Lord, we thank you for blessing him with all spiritual gifts. Spirit of wisdom is upon him. Spirit of knowledge, spirit of understanding, uh, uh, the spirit of anointing. Spiritual gifts are flowing, Lord, like rivers of living water from his spirit mind to his soul mind to achieve success in every area of his life, Lord. And as you are getting him deeply rooted into your word, Lord, you are also revealing to us, through him, the truth from the Bible. Thank you for this, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Abba Father. Unveiling us the truth about the Lord. Not letting our imagination um, um, you know, become vain. Lord, you are making this teaching very simple and easy now to understand, true brother. Through all... And to all the listeners, touching the hearts of all the souls around the world, Lord, we make this prayer, Abba Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Joyce. Thank you my, uh, for, for that wonderful opening prayer. And my sisters and brothers, a warm welcome to each one of you. Today, we are going to continue on the same topic that we have been studying all these days, and that is on bearing fruit. You know, for the last almost a month now, we have been, you know, studying on how each one of us has been called by the Lord in order to bear fruit. But again, bearing fruit is not the ultimate thing that the Lord wants to do. The first and important thing that he wants to do in our life is he wants to have a relationship with us. And you know, my brothers and sisters, once the Lord gets our heart, once he has got, you know, our entire selves, then it is possible for us to be used by the Lord so that, you know, you and I can be his hands, can be his feet, can be his very heart, can be his mind, to the world around us. And you know, my brothers and sisters, all these days, especially in the last two to three weeks, we have been studying about the hindrances that we must overcome in order to bear fruit. And for the last, you know, almost about four to five days, we have been studying from Roman chapter 12, verses one and two, that the first step that we need to take is to make a total commitment of our life to the Lord by being a living sacrifice. That's what we saw in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. You know, unless we offer our lives, unless we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, unless we make that commitment, there is no way that we are ever going to go to the next stage where we can actually renew our mind. You know, my brother says, what is the use of doing a lot of service for the Lord, doing a lot of service for mankind, if 
we are not going to make ourselves a living sacrifice we are not going to surrender ourselves to the lord you know once we surrender ourselves completely to the lord we you know make ourselves a living sacrifice now god can use you and me because for the lord to use you and me he needs our total commitment you know my brothers and sisters you can't be like 50% with the lord and 50% you know uh with the world and then expect the lord to use you mightily in order to bring fruit into the kingdom it's either the lord 100% or it's going to be weak with the world and nothing in between that's why you know if you read the book of revelation the lord says if i it's good if you are either hot or it's good if you are either cold but if you are lukewarm he says i'm going to simply spit you out of my mouth and you know my brothers and sisters most of the time when we begin to become lukewarm we just cannot be effective in the kingdom we just cannot bear the fruit in the kingdom and you know once we make that total commitment by offering our bodies offering our very life as a living sacrifice to the lord we then go to the next stage of you know renewing our mind you know once we renew our mind with god's word you know what is going to happen we will be able to produce the fruit that will last because surrendering to the lord and then allowing his word to take root within us and allowing this mind to be renewed with his word and then operating according to his word is simply going to allow the lord to use you and me to bear the fruit that will last forever and you know my sisters and brothers we saw that in the last few days that this thing is not going to happen overnight it's not going to happen by coming to a bible class in 3 4 days probably we had this teaching on roman chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 for about you know 3 or 4 days but in 3 or 4 days it will be impossible for us to you know really become people whom the lord can use because this whole process is going to be in steps and stages and as we you know my brothers and sisters make this journey in our life then the lord will be able to show us his very will he will able to show us his very purpose he will able to make us effective tools in his hand and we will be able to produce the fruit that will last forever amen so yesterday as we finished roman chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 i introduced you to roman chapter 1 roman chapter 1 verse number 21 and that's what we are going to study today my brothers and sisters so without any further delay i before we begin to with romans chapter 12 uh, chapter uh, 1 verse number 21 you know my brothers and sisters i want to just give you a little bit of an introduction you know this verse has a lot of things in it which we which we we must be aware of before we can start bearing the fruit that will last forever you know let us just read this verse roman chapter 12 uh, uh, chapter 1 verse number 21 and then i want to introduce you to what this verse is really saying and then we will take it uh, you know in detail we'll take it all in detail praise god thank you jesus thank you jesus because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened now this verse is saying because that when they knew god they glorified him not as god neither were they thankful but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened you know my brothers and sisters there's so many things for us to learn in this verse but i'm going to just come to the main thing that what i wanted to really share with you in this verse because this is all concerning bearing fruit for us and you know my brothers and sisters you will read in this verse number 21 that he says but they became vain in their imaginations they became vain in their imagination you know my sisters and brothers our imagination is one awesome gift i would say that god has given to each one of us and if we realize what we really have been given then we will really be able to bear fruit in our life you know my brothers and sisters i, I 
many of you will begin to think you know about imagination as something that you know you, you know you when when you talk to somebody you tell somebody you have let your imaginations run wild why will we tell somebody that their imaginations have run wild because they are speaking words and when they speak words which they don't really mean and you really know that person that sometimes you know we say that person is simply you know blowing a lot of hot gas they just speak a lot of words but there is really not much of you know depth in that person and then we tell that person you are letting your imaginations run wild so brothers and sisters what is saint paul saying when he makes this statement by saying because but because became vain in their imagination what is he saying you know my brothers and sisters before we really go to you know anything we can study in this verse you know i want to just show you that without our imagination we will never be able to function in this life you know without an imagination you and i will never be able to function in our life let me let me just give you a, a little bit of an introduction to this word imagination so that now as you begin to understand this word imagination you will now begin to appreciate what this verse number 21 is talking all about now for example my brothers and sisters if i tell each one of you can you tell me what are the how many are the number of doors and windows in your house if i just tell you can you just tell me right now you know just one number i want to know how many doors how many windows are there in your house and you know my brothers and sisters none of you will able to tell me exactly the figure but if i tell you you know take your time sit in that place and tell me and now you will begin to close your eyes and you will say okay i've got my kitchen i've got my bedroom i've got my living room i've got the entrance i've got the porch and then you will begin to start counting in your mind the number of windows the number of doors that you have in the house and finally you will add them up all up together without physically going to the place and you will be able to come and tell me that these are the number of doors and these are the number of windows i mean nobody in our house even today if you ask me i've never counted the number of doors and windows but you know if if somebody asks me i can immediately go ahead and say to them yes in our in our bedroom there is one door there is one window there is a particular living room where there are two windows and i can add them all up together and i can finally come to a figure okay let me give you another example you know say for example you know you are living in a particular city say for example my sister uh, joyce is living in the in in perth in that particular town where she lives and i tell her sister joyce i would like you to take me from your house onto a particular market which is close by now since she is familiar with the place even if i tell her you know you don't take me but you just give me the direction and she'll say to me you say you go out of the street take a right then go down the road straight take a left again take a right and then finally on the left hand side you will find the market she can say this to me even without coming with me because in her mind she already knows the direction she already can uh, you know point out how exactly from a house she can get to the market and you know my brothers and sisters in the same way you and i have been given this beautiful gift of imagination by the lord you know many a times there are so many events that took place in our past there are so many things that we want to happen in our near future and you know unless we are able to think it in our mind first according to god's word we will never be able to see that particular situation come to pass which means if we are not thinking according to the word we are not making our imagination according to the word we are simply opening our mouth and rattling a lot of prayers and rattling a lot of scriptures you know my sisters and brothers we will never ever be able to see god's word come to pass in our life and why is that let me give you another example say for example you open the television in the evening see you know after this class it is probably you know say say 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock and you switch on your television and you see the announcer on the on the news he's they say you know they are, they are announcing the news but in 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 the in the in the in the in the audio although you see the person reading the news in the audio you are hearing the commentary of a cricket match or a football match now 
Although on that screen, you're watching the announcer say to you the evening news or whatever news they're going to give. But if the audio is simply different, is there a mismatch? 100% there is a mismatch. And many times on television, it does happen because of jamming of signals that what you see on the, on the video and what you hear on the audio do not match. It doesn't happen too often, but it does happen wherein the audio and the video do not match. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, when we are thinking in our mind, when we are thinking in our imagination, something which is contrary to what we are speaking with our mouth, there is definitely going to be a mismatch. And as a result, what we are praying for will never ever come to pass. Remember, my brothers and sisters, in order for our imagination not to be vain, it is important for us to imagine in our mind, in our video, and the words that we are speaking to be in perfect harmony. You know, my brothers and sisters, you know, there are many times as I was introducing you yesterday to, you know, uh, Roman chapter 1 verse 21. I even talked to you about, you know, 1 Peter 2, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24. And, you know, we all know that scripture which says, by the stripes and by the wounds of Jesus, we have been healed. Now, even though you know that scripture, by the stripes and wounds of Jesus, you have been healed, Yet, in your imagination, you can see yourself completely sick. You can see yourself in pain. You can see yourself, you know, in the bed, lying in the bed. You can see yourself with all, the, all that what the doctor has said, that you should be in the bed for so many uh, days or probably weeks. But if you can change in your imagination that you are already well, that you're already walking, that you're already running, that you're absolutely normal, and you open your mouth, and start speaking the word with this imagination, then exactly what you are believing here and what you are speaking with your mouth will simply be in harmony and you will begin to see God's glory because it's not we who are waiting on God. God is waiting on us in order to have our audio and our video match so that he can give us what his word has already promised us. You know, my sister and brothers, I'm trying to give you an introduction to this particular verse number 21. There are a lot of things for us, how we can get our imagination vain and how we can make our imagination so strong when we actually practice ourselves how to receive from God and how once we receive, we can teach others how to start bearing the fruit of the kingdom. You know, my brothers and sisters, listen to this very carefully. You know, before many, many times you hear the word of God, you are right now in an absolutely sick state of mind. Your mind is absolutely, you know, thinking sick. You're thinking lack. You're thinking, you know, uh, all the negative things around in your life. And somewhere you go to a Bible class or you go and hear the preaching and you begin to hear the word of God. But because you have not changed the, the video here in your mind, you are simply opening your mouth. Probably you'll have the scriptures noted down. You probably have them, you know, by hearted. And you keep on opening your mouth and rattling them over and over again. But you are not thinking, you are not imagining yourself according to what that word says. And therefore, it is very important to just come in the presence of God. It is the, that scripture very, very clearly says in, in Psalm 46.10. Can we go in Psalm 46.10? You know, in Psalm 46.10, the Lord very tells us, Be still, he says, and know that I am and God. Be still and know that I am God. Let's read that. Let's read that. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. So what is the Lord saying in Psalm 4610? He's saying be still. Be still. Just be still means literally be still. Don't move your hands. Don't move your feet. Don't have, you know, don't do multitasking. Don't have, you know, something in the oven. Don't try to be talking to somebody in your, in your family. Just be still in the presence of the Lord and just take in his word. And as you take in his word, allow that word to soak into your spirit. Allow that word to soak into your heart. Allow that word to speak back to you. Start making an imagination in your mind. Start seeing what that word is, is saying to you. And now when you begin to see it on the inside, now start opening your mouth and start speaking exactly what you are seeing in your mind, what you are seeing in your imagination. And you know, my brothers and sisters, 
it won't be long before you will begin to see the supernatural on a daily basis. It will become natural for you to see the supernatural every single day of your life. You know, my brothers and sisters, this is a secret that the Lord is giving each one of us. I hope you are receiving this right now. Because you can go and listen to a dozen preachers. You can listen to the word of God every single day. But if you are not prepared to change your imagination, you're not able to change the video on the inside. You're not able to start thinking and seeing what the word says on the inside first. It will never come to pass on the outside. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it is so very important for us to remember this truth according to Roman chapter 1, verse 21. And in order for our imagination not to go vain, we are going to study today what this verse tells us so that our imagination can become according to the word of God. And now we can receive everything that the word tells us and we can also begin to bear the fruit of the kingdom. So let's go and read verse number 21 again. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now, you know, my brothers and sisters, before you come to verse number 21, I want to go back to from verses 18 to 20. So let's go and read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 20, because in from 18 to 20, St. Paul speaks about something else. Because it's, it's a prelude or it's something which is a preparation before we reach verse number 21. So let's read from verses 18 to 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God had showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Look at the words St. Paul is describing here from verses 18 to 20. You know, my brother says, St. Paul is saying in these verses, and again, I'm going to paraphrase it. You know, he tells us that every person on this earth has an intuitive knowledge. What is the meaning of intuitive knowledge? It is like a built-in. You know, sometimes we talk about, you know, a particular phone or a mobile phone. We say it has got a built-in microphone or it has got a built-in, you know, calculator. Or it has got a built-in uh, particular device. So it's got a built-in program. Something is built-in. So every human being who comes to this planet Earth has already been, you know, given an intuitive knowledge, something which is already pre-programmed of the knowledge of the anger of God on the inside. We know that if we do something wrong, there is a God who's going to be, you know, there is that there's the wrath of God. That's what he says, because he says here for the wrath of God in verse number 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. You know, my sister and brothers, nobody can say that, you know, there is no God inside each one of us. Even, you, you know, you talk about the people who are atheists, people who, who say they don't believe in God or those who are agnostics. You know, those people, they say there is no God. But you know what? If there is something, anything, I mean, the image will say, oh, God, they'll say. Because there is something within us which will always tell us that there is a power, there is someone greater than us who has created us. And therefore, it is inbuilt in every single person that there is a God and there is an account, there is a responsibility, there is an accountability to this God who has created us. And then let's go to verse number 21. You know, with this background, once we get, you know, what he says between 18 to 20, now let us look at verse number 21. Praise God. Now, in verse number 21, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. You know, my brothers, beginning with verse number 21, 
Saint Paul is describing, you know, like I would say, the the progressive steps that people take from, you know, take away from God. They take away from going from God, which is which is already given to them as a built-in revelation. We saw that between 18 to 21, that you know, God has already put something on the inside where we should honor Him as God. That we should really honor Him as the divine. We should honor Him as that superpower. We should honor Him as somebody, although He's not visible, but He's somebody who has created us. And therefore, even though there is something which is built inside of us, this verse number 21, St. Paul is describing of the progressive steps. It's not going to happen all of a sudden. It's not going to happen overnight, but it's going to happen progressively that people, you know, move away from God even though this built-in revelation or this built-in intuitive knowledge of God has been given to them. And the fact, my brothers and sisters, that people depart from this inbuilt intuition or from this revelation does not, you know, nullify or I would say make void the fact that God has placed this particular, uh, you know, design inside of us. That, you know, he has given us this intuitive knowledge that he is really God, that we should honor him. And, you know, my brothers and sisters, the steps described in this verse here in this verse number 21, uh, you know, here in walking away from that revelation, apply to anything the Lord has shown us or spoken to us. You know, sisters and brothers, unless the Lord speaks to us through his word, we will never know that we are either moving away from him or we are getting closer to him. Yes, he has already given us that intuitive knowledge. He has already given us that revelation. He has already created us because there is an inbuilt, you know, information on the inside of us, even though we may not be believers in every single person, that there is a supernatural power. There is a God that we need to honor, that we need to always look up to. But this verse number 21 is simply taking us, you know, in, in progressive steps, how in spite of knowing this revelation and in spite of all the words that God has spoken to us through his word, how we can simply drift away from the Lord or on the other side, we can come closer to the Lord. And you know, my brothers and sisters, let's go back to this verse again and see what are the, what are the steps. There are actually, if you see, there are three steps. So let's go step by step and see how we can move away from the Lord or how we can actually come closer to the Lord and how when we move away, we, we, become, we become vain in our imagination and our foolish hearts get darkened. So the first step is that people take away from any revelation that God has given them is that they fail to glorify him as God. They fail to glorify him as God. Look at this verse, what St. Paul is saying in, what, in, in, in 21. He's saying, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not they glorified him not. That means they did not glorify him as God. And you know, my sister and brothers, this word glorified simply means, you know, to, to, to render, uh, you know, to render glorious or to, or, to, or to esteem somebody. To esteem, you know, you basically respect somebody, you honor somebody, you put a value onto somebody. And this word esteem actually means, you know, to place a high value on. It's, it, it means to put a prize on, to, to give respect, to judge, or, you know, probably would say, you know, people will actually magnify or esteem or place a great value on something when they do that other than God. You know, my sister and brothers, God is saying to us that we need to glorify him as God. We need to give a respect to him as God. We need to give him that value. We need to esteem him. We need to put our focus on him. We need to, you know, uh, apart from anything else in this world, he simply needs to come as number one. There should be nothing in our life that should ever come between us and God. Because God is the one who's our creator. We should esteem him in the highest. And therefore, if anything comes in the way between God and us, we are simply not going to give him that esteem. We are simply not going to glorify him. We are simply going to come, you know, like lukewarm people and we will never be able to esteem him and respect him and honor him and give him the number one position that he has already told us in his word. Where did he say that? 
when he gave the two commandments in, the, in you know when he gave the 10 commandments in the old testament and again when jesus repeated them in the new testament he says you shall love the lord your god with all your heart he never said with 50% of your heart he never said with 90% of your heart he said you shall love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind with all your strength and then of course he talked about the neighbor but he was saying there should be nothing that should come between him and god and therefore brothers and sisters it is important for us to esteem god to you know to place a great value on god and we should never give anyone or anything a place greater than god in our life you know my brothers and sisters let, let me let me show you in hebrews chapter 11 verse 26 you know moses esteemed reproach to be greater than riches you know he esteemed reproach to be greater than riches that's exactly what it says in hebrew chapter 11 verse 26 let us look at that hebrew chapter 11 verse number 26 esteeming the reproach of christ greater riches than the treasures in egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the award, of the reward what was moses looking at you know my brothers and sisters moses was a prince Moses was in the palace he had everything found for him he he, he knew that the, the the israelite people the jews were suffering what did it matter to him they are suffering they are being tortured they are like slaves he is having a nice time in the palace he is a he is a prince there are people you know even helping him to put food in his mouth he's got everything found he's like a he's like a real prince there is got no work to do but look at what the word says he esteemed the reproach of christ greater riches than the treasures in egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward when you're looking at the eternal report reward you're looking at christ you're looking at where we are going to be after this life when you're looking at there that for eternity we are going to spend time with christ what greater thing that will ever stop us on this life to ever esteem more than with christ whom we are going to live forever and you know my brothers and sisters this example of moses is saying moses did not focus on the riches moses did not focus on you know on on the great pomp and splendor of the palace moses did not look at egypt as 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 his ultimate heaven on earth but he always looked at at that reward which god was going to give him because there was something on the inside that was telling him there is something wrong here he was a jew he was a hebrew at but he had been taken out and and planted in the palace that too not deliberately but by supernaturally when his mother had put him into that little basket and left him pharaoh's daughter adopted him and raised him up inside the palace but on the inside he was still a jew he was circumcised he had a covenant with god and god was actually training him in the palace so that one day this very palace where he was trained he would be able to have access to that knowing how the system works so that he could get the jews to the promised land and you know my brothers and sisters that's exactly what moses did he esteemed christ more than even his position even all the riches in egypt let us look at jesus jesus de esteemed the suffering of the cross so he 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 never looked at the suffering of the cross as something you know which is going to be so much of pain so much of hardship but he focused instead on you and me who would be freed through the suffering let's go to hebrew chapter 12 verse number 2 you know brothers and sisters when you look at hebrew chapter 12 verse number 2 jesus could have said i am the lord of lords i am the king of kings i am the creator why should i go for to suffer on the cross why should i go through all this pain why should i go through all this suffering for what reason i don't need to i'm the creator but look at what he what the verse Uh, Roman uh, Hebrew chapter twelve verse number two says, "Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God." So look at this, my brothers and sisters. What is the Hebrew writer saying? He said looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame 
and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Why did he go to the cross with joy? The word of God tells us in Hebrew chapter 2, 12, verse number 2, that Jesus endured the cross with joy. You know, my brothers and sisters, you know what is joy? Joy is simply knowing that the end result is always going to be victory. I know right now, as you are hearing right now this word, there are people who will hear it later on the internet, on YouTube. You must be going through some situation in your life. Maybe you're going through a marriage crisis. Maybe you're going through a financial problem. Maybe you're going through, you know, uh, uh, a situation in your relationship. Maybe you're going through a job problem. I don't know, you may be going through, you know, a health problem in your life. Some of you may be going through some particular situation. here. Maybe you're going through an issue with your children. Maybe there is an issue in your family. I don't know what the real issue is. But do you know, my sister and brothers, whatever be your issue right now, whatever be your problem right now, if you are going to focus on the problem instead of keeping your focus on Jesus, keeping your focus on his word, knowing that you're not going to let your joy be affected because when you know you're with the word, you can make that imagination of yours according to the word because God is always faithful to his word. So although you're going through a negative situation in your life right now, you know and you know when you are with the word of God, it's a matter of time that you're going to see your situation change because God is always faithful. And therefore, you can be in joy. You can be at rest in your mind. You can be in total peace, even though you're going through that crisis, because you know and you know that the end result is always going to be victory. I know, my brothers and sisters, some of you who are listening right now, I hope you're getting answers to your problem because many a times we come to the Lord and we say, Lord, when will my situation change? When will things get better in my life? When will you answer my prayer? I know there is a prophecy on my life. I know that the, the word of God has been spoken over my life. I know that the prophetic words have been poured over me. But when is that word going to come to pass? My brothers and sisters, I want you to focus on the word. I want you to focus on that promise. I want you to be with joy because when you look at the author and finisher of our faith, just as Jesus looked at the joy of knowing that you and I would believe in him would be safe for all eternity when, we, when he went to that cross. In the same way, when you and I keep our focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, we know and we know that our situation is only temporary. You can tell your situation right now to using the word of God. Tell your situation, talk to your problem and say, you are temporary. You are not going to be eternal because the word of God is eternal. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when you begin to magnify God's word and not magnify your problem, you know, many a times when we are talking in our communication, you know, it's just become a habit to us. We'll ask somebody, how are you? And that person will rattle all their problem. You know, I, the doctor said this, and this one said this, and the lawyer said this, and you will tell all the stories about who said what. Why aren't we opening our mouth and speaking what our God has said in his promises to us? And you know, my brothers and sisters, the more you begin to magnify the word, the more you begin to esteem the word, the more you begin to place a value on the word of God, the more you begin to respect the word of God, I tell you, your situation is only temporary. You can be in this Bible class and you can listen to this, but as soon as the Bible class is over, you can go back to your life and open your mouth and blow up your miracle because you have not esteemed the word after the Bible class when the real test begins. You have only esteemed the word in the Bible class. You have only esteemed the word of God when you are in church. But the moment you came out, you simply drifted away and you aborted your miracle. My brothers and sisters, remember, putting a value on God, putting a value on or esteeming his word is not only like having a breakfast, lunch and a dinner. It's not an activity. It is a lifestyle. And therefore, when I begin to put a value on God's word, when I begin to value his word 24 seven, I continually begin to renew our mind. Remember what we learned yesterday in Romans chapter 12 verses one and two, because we are going to move to the next stage about, you know, uh, having that imagination. Now, as we begin to esteem the word, as we begin to magnify the word, now we begin to see God's glory in our life. You know, my brother says, if you go to the Psalmist, I believe it is in Psalm 69, verse number 30. Can we go there, please? 
Psalm 69, verse number 30. Psalm 69, verse number 30. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. I will praise the name of the Lord with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. You know, my sister and brothers, what are we doing when we open our mouths and sing a song? If you're going to praise God, you know, many times you hear these people say, when you, when you sing, you're praising double. I really still haven't understood that why people say when you sing, you're praising God double. Because when you open your mouth, you can only praise the Lord as much as you're going to thank him. But even if we, if we do believe that when you sing, you're praising him double, then the word of God tells us that when we open our mouth and come praising the Lord, we are simply to praise him with thanksgiving. Psalm 69 verse number 30 says, we magnify God one, you know, you know, that's exactly with thanksgiving. We magnify him with thanksgiving. You know, my friends, let us let us go to Luke's gospel. I'm, I'm reminded of Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 17, I believe. That was the story where Jesus healed the lepers. You know, there was there were, I think, 10 lepers there, and Luke chapter 17, verses 16 to 18. Let's read that. You know, Jesus healed 10 lepers. 10 lepers got healed. But only one who was a Samaritan came back to thank him. Let's read that. Just let's listen to what it says about thanksgiving. And fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered, saying, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. You know, my sister and brothers, even the people of Israel, even the people who were Jews, who had a covenant with God, they thought that God owed it to them. God actually owed the people of Israel. That's the attitude they had. And you know, my brothers and sisters, when you read in Luke chapter 17, what do you read? There were 10 lepers there who received healing from Jesus. Nine of them were Jews and only one was a Samaritan. But it was the Samaritan who came back in order to thank Jesus. And Jesus said to this leper who returned and gave him thanks for his healing. He says, you are the only one who came to glorify me. There were 10, he says, where are the other nine? Why did the others not come back to thank me? And you know, my sister and brothers, out of the 10 lepers, only one man turned up. I want to ask you and I mean, each one of us this question. You know, God has, has, has done so much in our life. God has done so many things. And yet, my brothers and sisters, if there are 10 things that God has done, we always will focus on that one thing, which, which we, we are still having a problem. And as a result, we simply don't thank him. We don't magnify him. But we are magnifying that one thing which is negative in our life. And you know, my sister and brothers, as long as we are going to change, you know, but for example, when you look at this glass right now, this glass is half full. I can look at it as half empty, or I can look at it as half full. And you know, my sister and brothers, in the same way, if I have a paper with me, you know, if I have a paper with me here, you know, I mean, on that paper, there is a small black dot. And you know, if you ask somebody, can you see this paper? Somebody wants to look at this paper with that black dot will say, yes, I see a paper with the black dot. And if you, if you tell somebody else, they say, I see a white sheet of paper. He doesn't even see the black dot because it's just a matter of perception. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, when you and I in our life begin to magnify, begin to be thankful to what God has already done for us. You know, every day when we get up, there are so many reasons for us to thank God. The very fact that he has given us a new day, the very fact that we are living, the very fact in this pandemic where thousands and thousands of people have lost their life, we are still alive that we can hear his word. The fact that, you know, we have got our family, the very fact that, you know, we can hear his word and we can be a blessing in the lives of others. There is so much to be thankful for. But yet, my brothers and sisters, you know, when we begin to put a value on everything else or begin to magnify those little things which are negative in our life, we are simply magnifying our problem. We are simply glorifying that problem. 
we are becoming vain in our imagination. We are becoming vain in our imagination. You know, my brothers and sisters, when Jesus said to this leper, did not 10 people get healed? Where are the other nine? Wasn't he expecting the other nine people to come and say thank you to him? Surely he was expecting. But only one man turned up. And when that one man turned up and thanked him, you know what Jesus said to him? If you go to a particular verse, he says, go, he says, your faith has made you whole. Because you came and thanked me, your faith has made you whole. You know, thanksgiving will bring a blessing in every area of your life. You know, my brothers, please remember this. Many a times God has healed us of our sickness. God has healed us of our problems. God has healed us in our, in our financial needs. God has even healed our marriages. God has brought, you know, blessings in our families. But many a times we simply receive the blessing and we, oh, we think God owes it to us. He has to give it to us. And we don't show that gratitude by being grateful to him, by the way we behave, by the way we show that attitude. And as a result, we simply don't receive the blessings in other areas of our life. But the moment we have an attitude of gratitude, that we are always grateful to the people, we are always grateful to God, we are always grateful to the people who he has sent in our life. You know what happens, my brothers and sisters? God begins to bless us in every single area of our life. He begins to make us whole and brings healing, not just in our health, not just in our finance, but in our relationships, in our, you know, in all the things that are there of our luck in our life, it just blesses every area. I know, my brothers and sisters, if you go to Romans chapter four, let's go back to, uh, to Romans, the book of Romans. Romans chapter four, I believe it is verse 19 onwards, 19 to 21. You know, Abraham was a man with a very strong faith. He always gave glory to God. Let's read that. We, let's talk about Abraham for a little while before we end the session today. There's so much to learn here. We are only on the first step. Because we are learning how we should not get our minds, you know, in uh, our imagination vain. So we are talking about, you know, magnifying God. Let's read that. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. When you read verse number 19, my brothers and sisters, and you look at what the situation of Abraham and Sarah is, in the natural, there is no way that Abraham can become a father. Maybe, yes, Abraham, the man can become, but, but Sarah, who's already 89, it says, the deadness of Sarah's womb. Sarah's womb was dead. She had already passed her stage. She probably had come to menopause. She had probably passed the age of childbearing. And now... How could Abraham ever believe that his wife, Sarah, would bear him a son? You know, my brothers, this is in the natural, when you look through your physical eyes, there are so many things which will say, because the world will tell us it looks absolutely impossible. But Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God. You know, my sisters and brothers, Abraham esteemed God's promise more than he valued anything else. You know, the moment you put a value on, on, on your situation, you put a value on what the doctor has said, you put a value on what the lawyer has said, you put a value on what the minister has said, you put a, you put a value on what the prime minister has said, you put a value on what, the, what, what he said and she said, you know what is going to happen? You will never be able to give esteem to God's word. You know, sister and brothers, I'll tell you, I'll tell you honestly about my own self. This is, I'm talking only for myself. You know, before I really came to the word of God, before I really began to have a relationship with the Lord, I'm, I'm not reached yet, I'm not perfect yet, I'm still on my journey. But before I really came to study God's word, you know, my sister and brothers, I gave a lot of value to people, you know, who call themselves religious, who call themselves, you know, people who, are, who could use the pulpit because I did not know the word. So whatever they said was what is acceptable to me and I would take it in. And I would really try to, you know, esteem it very much because I never opened my Bible. I never asked the Holy Spirit to teach me. So whatever somebody said, I valued it very much. As I began to study God's word, as I began to study it and ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, I said, I want to offer my body as a living sacrifice. I'm going to come up a, up a white pole. I'm going to come with a white flag. I'm going to surrender to you, Lord, because I want to do what your word says. You know, when I began to do that, my brothers and began to renew our mind. 
this mind of mine began to go for a real spin. Literally, it began to go for a spin. You know why? Because there were so many things that I had esteemed before the word, before the word of God. I had esteemed people who had spoken the, you know, had explained the word. But when I began to come to the word and I began to understand what the Holy Spirit was saying, there was so much of confusion in my mind that literally I had to unlearn. I had to, I had to disrespect, dishonor so many things which I had learned before to in order honor and esteem God's written word. You know, my brothers and sisters, I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. I'm telling you my own challenges, my own difficulties. Before, I went through a very great battle in my mind. I used to value, I used to esteem a lot of people who, because they used to go to the pulpit, because I do not know the word. When you are ignorant, you can esteem anybody who gives you a nice homily or a nice talk or you are a nice, you know, motivational talk. But when you come to the truth and when you come to the Holy Spirit, there is no way that you are ever going to hear and disrespect the word of God because you can dishonor and de-esteem anything else other than the word. And the Holy Spirit gives you that revelation and he gives you the secret. In the same way, my brothers and sisters, Abraham, he was given a promise that he would bear a son, Isaac, in his old age. He knew in the physical that there was no way he and Sarah could bear the child. But you know, my brothers and sisters, Abraham was strong in faith. He glorified God. He esteemed God's word. He esteemed God's promise more than anything else in this life. And what happened finally? He received what the Lord promised him. He was able to be a father when he was 99 years old and his wife Sarah at 89. You know, my brothers, before I end today, I want to give you a, a, a very practical example of something that happens in our day-to-day -day life, especially when you talk about you know, hearing the words of others. For example, you go to the doctor. Okay, you got a particular XYZ sickness, you got a discomfort in your body, and you go to the doctor. And the doctor says to you, you're going to die. He says to you, you know, there's nothing that can be done. You know, your situation is so, so, so bad. You are at fourth stage or your fourth and half stage or fifth stage. I don't know what stage you are. He says, no medication is going to work for you. You know, my brothers and sisters, even if the doctor says you're going to die, that won't stop you from being healed unless you place a higher value on what the doctor says than what God has said in his word. You know, my sister and brothers, many a times because some expert has said something, because the lawyer has said something, because the judge has said something, because the PM has said something, because the doctor or some surgeon or some specialist of this world has said something, we simply value that word because we have got so much of knowledge based on that sickness through Google and Yahoo and I don't know how many things on the, on the internet that we have failed to value God's word and value God's promise. You know, sisters and brothers, if you and I can glorify God instead of the sickness, you will be able to appropriate, you will be able to receive what the promise says and sickness will have to flee from you because to be spiritually minded is to have life and is to have peace. Let's take our final scripture for today. I want to take you to Roman chapter 8, verse number 6. Roman chapter 8, verse number 6. You know, my sister and brothers, Roman chapter 8, verse number 6 simply says, to be spiritually minded is to have a life and peace. Whereas to be, you know, to be, to be, to be, to be bothered about, to be in the flesh is simply not going to help us. Let's read that. What it says, Romans chapter 8, verse number 6. So, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded, what is the meaning to be carnally minded? A person who operates according to what they see, what they hear, what they taste, what they smell, what they feel, according to their five senses, is a person who's carnally minded. But a person whose focus is on the word of God, whose focus is on the sixth sense, which says what the word says, because the word is simply, un, is not, you know, you cannot see it with your eyes. You have to see it through your, through your mind. You have to see it through your imagination. You have to begin to see the healing. You have to begin to see the word to what the word is saying by making an imagination in your mind. And so, brothers and sisters, when you are going to think according to the word, when you're going to think spiritually, when you're going to be spiritually minded, the first thing that you're going to experience is 
you are going to experience life you are going to experience peace but the moment you are going to think according to your senses what you feel what he said what she said what the doctor said what the lawyer said what my in law said what my parents said simply my brothers and sisters we are simply going to end up into death that's exactly what it says to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace and you know my brothers and sisters we should begin to magnify the lord instead of you know uh, the negative report in our life instead of magnifying you know the report of the doctor and you know my brothers and sisters how do we do that we do that by controlling our hearts and by controlling our thinking you know the more god has given us this great ability to think it's not given to everybody only to human beings you know our thoughts magnify whatever we focus or what we are thinking on the moment we are thinking on something we can keep on magnifying it we can keep on meditating on it we can keep on you know uh, you know simply magnifying magnify means just make it so huge we can make a mountain of a mole hill but brothers and sisters once we begin to think according to the word of god we can simply let our problem look so small with respect to our big god that we will begin to see the glory in our life you know if we see you know probably you know in our in our life there's a marriage problem a marital problem what should we do you know we should go to god's word and magnify what god has said instead of what we are seeing in our life many times people what they do they simply begin to magnify their problem they will tell others you know what my spouse is like this my wife is like this my husband is like this my children are like that instead of me telling other people what the real problem is take the word of god magnify it start taking the juice out of it start you know meditating on it start ruminating on it and as you begin to ruminate on it as you begin to magnify the word as you begin to you know glorify the word you will begin to see your problem looking so small that eventually you will begin to see the new fact the truth will change your facts and you will begin to see god's glory in your life you know my brothers when we come back tomorrow let's go further and deeper into the subject because we are trying to learn how we should not get our imagination vain when we have the video in our mind going exactly what the word says when we simply open our mouth we'll begin to see the glory we'll begin to see the miracles flowing in our life because that is the secret that is going to help us in order to bear the fruit amen let us pray sister marcela uh, sister who's that who's going to be rena sister rena let us pray Thank you God our Father um Jesus and the Holy Spirit in your name we pray um that we will this, we will find how to match the video and the audio together so by listening to your word and finding the way how to implement that in our lives in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit amen 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 thank you Jesus Thank you Jesus praise God praise God